Hey everyone, welcome to the Happy Farm D podcast. This is Alex Barker. Hey, I'm here in this episode taking over for Chris. And the reason is, is because I'm selfish, but you're gonna get a lot of benefit out of it because we're talking about how DeLon Canterbury took, I would say a pretty painful situation and turned it into a completely new career and business for himself, helping uh, people through patient care and through doing an amazing job in his company, Geriatrics. I first ran across DeLon on LinkedIn and we at the Happy Farm D wanted to start a speakers mastermind group. I learned a bit, a little bit about him. He shared his story and I thought, oh, this is such a hard story, but it's so good that I wanted to share it with you, inspire you. And I think you're going to learn more about how easy it is actually to get into entrepreneurship. It is hard. It's challenging, but it's not as difficult. The barrier isn't too high. And I also think you're hopefully going to leave this a little bit inspired about what's going on in your career, your journey. And it doesn't have to be a business that you start, but it could be something new, a new career. And so, Delon, thanks for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. Oh, man, Alex, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me today. So I don't want to spoil anything. I think I kind of teased a little <laughs> bit, but <clears throat> you and I kind of have similar, uh, I would say, starting careers. But mm -hmm. let's let's start from you getting into pharmacy. Tell us about how that started for yourself. Oh, man, for sure. So um, yeah, this, this was, believe it or not, a nerdy calling of mine since middle school. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have a Caribbean family and my parents are from Guyana, South America. So we grew up strictly on herbal products and natural stuff like all day, every day, right? We didn't believe in taking any pills. It was always like Vicks and this bitter tea concoction my mom would make whenever we got sick. And so that really sparked an interest in understanding the medicine and pharmacology behind these herbs and these drugs and seeing how we can heal people. So really, I've had that interest since middle school. That is, that is a fact. Um, but and that led me to pharmacy because it was just intriguing knowing how we can help people with that knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all come into pharmacy kind of bleeding hearts. Like, oh, yeah, I'll save the world. And that's kind of how I was, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty active in my fraternity. I'm all about servant leadership. And so even during school, I, I served as the SNAFA president and delegate for my chapter. Um, and honestly, I learned so much about the disparities that we see in healthcare. Um, even at UNC, number one pharmacy school, there were disparities there. And even in, as a part of the program, there were prejudices I've had the experience and fight through just to graduate. And so the world of pharmacy to me, you know, at first was really, oh, this is great. Let's save the world. And then it became very bleak after my first year or two in working retail as a floater and eventually pharmacist manager uh, with Walgreens. And, you know, I'm here in Durham, North Carolina. I worked in a very high traffic rural town called Henderson. And, you know, you start seeing patterns, especially with my older patients, I'm seeing either older patients who just have questions that should have been answered like last year, or I'm seeing minorities who are just getting left on the wayside with our broken healthcare system. So really the journey, not to go too far into the weeds, started with this passion that turned into complete hell hell on earth for me as a pharmacist and really with healthcare as a whole. Um, so I, you know, working as a pharmacy manager, it, it was great with the people I, I met and worked with, but I kept seeing the same issues. I kept seeing duplicate medications. I kept seeing errors where people are being put in the hospital because their blood thinner was too expensive. You know, and it was just heartbreaking having to tell people, hey, your copay is $1,000 with your Medicare insurance bill, you know, and that's something that that hits a chord with you. After a while, you kind of lose your yourself in, in that space. You just end up 
being another drone. And that's what I felt when I was struggling through retail pharmacy. And so give us a timeline. When did you start practicing? For sure. I I graduated pharmacy school in 2014 and uh, pretty much jumped right into the workforce with Walgreens as a floater for about six months. I was then a pharmacy manager in 2015 at that Henderson store at Walgreens for about two and a half years. I then got a promotion and became the pharmacy manager for Walgreens specialty site in Durham, um, dealing and I was uh, serving as an HIV pharmacist there. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, that long story, which became another close call with being terminated as a pharmacist, uh, led to me being forced to step down and go back into the retail world as a pharmacy manager at a tier four, 24 hour busy store. So at that point, we're talking 2017, 2018. Um, and at this point, this is like the lowest of the law. And I was like, all right, you took me out of the heavens of specialty for some BS. And now I'm back in the 24 hour world, managing a team of 23 people trying to get coverage for texts that call out left and right. Living nightmare, especially when you're doing five, 600, uh, you know, uh, scripts a day. So that now we're talking 2017, 2018, and I was there for about a year and a half. Um, and honestly, that my friend was the low point for me. That was where I had, I got so depressed, Alex. Like I really got so angry and depressed. Like I literally started hating myself. I started hating my patients. I started hating anyone who walked in front of me just because I wanted to clock out and go home. Yeah. And it was a, a, a point where I had to really meet, where does Delon want to be in five years, in three years, tomorrow? Where do I want to be mentally? Like, do I want to keep doing this that I've been doing for five years? Or do I want to actually change this mindset and find the happiness that I've neglected all this time? And so, you know, I would see your posts, Alex, and be like, oh, this guy can't be that happy. Get out of here. This guy is, this guy is not, <laughs> this guy is BS. He's just, just, just trying to blow some smoke. Um, but honestly, it took me five to six years to reach the equivalent of Alex Barker's Happy Farm B, you know? And that was where I started volunteering, man. I started getting back into what made me happy. And it was about service. It was about people. It was about bridging those access barriers that we see as pharmacists, but you can't always address it because you're just go, go, go in a retail setting. And even in a hospital setting, you're there, you check some scripts, you round, you do some amazing work, but we're not necessarily battling the health equity piece that healthcare has grossly neglected, right? And so after seeing countless people go broke from medicine, I found a way to serve as a consultant or as a pharmacist consultant with senior pharmacist, where I acted on their formulary committee, which is a nonprofit, amazing group led by Gina Upchurch, who focuses on getting Medicare eligible people enrolled with um, the best Medicare plans objectively while saving them thousands of dollars. So I'm thinking, wow, pharmacists can do this? Like we have a bigger reach than just dispensing and hospital orders, like we can actually go the extra mile and demonstrate value. And that just clicked, man. It just changed my whole mindset of, you know what, this is what I have to do. And so this is, mind you, 2019, last year retail pharmacy, I decided, you know, I kept doing this, volunteering, seeing what pharmacists can do outside of those traditional lenses. And I was like, yo, I gotta step down. I gotta step down. I can't do this anymore. My soul is dead. Uh, and so I didn't even tell Walgreens, this is a little bit of a secret, but I was like, yo, let me step down to part-time and I'm going to pivot to another job in Charlotte. So I became a poison control pharmacist um, just to focus that calling. And mm. eventually, Alex, which you'll find out, I had to leave that job as well to start this journey with geriatrics. Lots to break down. I think there's a really interesting point, and I, I'm very curious about how people do this. Um, I've been teaching about burnout and CEs. We've had like over a good 12,000 people that have seen our presentations, mainly pharmacists, technicians, and nurses. 
Mm-hmm. And the common question I get is, if you're burned out, how do you break free? Mm. The literature is all over the place. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> resiliency, mindfulness, in my opinion, don't, those things, they help, they're good. They don't fix the issue. Mm. If you're still in the environment that's causing burnout. Mm. So you kind of had this, maybe it was over a period of time, maybe it was a wake up moment in the middle of the night. And you said, all right, Delon, I've had enough. Mm-hmm. I, I'm burned out. I'm like you. When I had a phone call coming in from a patient, I'm like, oh, <laughs> just leave me alone. Like, I don't want to talk to you. So I, I get that. Mm-hmm. How, what, what did that transition from I'm miserable to I'm, I'm tired of being miserable? What did that look like for you? Was, there, was it a moment? Was it a transition? <laughs> Where did you look for your solution? Absolutely. Um, You know, despite the point of desperation, where I got fired from that Charlotte job as a poison control pharmacist during COVID, um, you know, I had that fire to to pursue geriatrics before. And, you know, the breaking point was, you know, apart from just seeing these metrics that don't mean anything to patient care, become the standard of care. And here we are fooling, you know, a checklist into thinking that this is what's going to look good for the insurance payers. And therefore we're making better outreach. It's, it's all a game. And so apart from being so dark, so depressed, so hopeless with this field, I had to find that little bit of joy. And I I don't know how my girlfriend Deanna dealt with me, but she found a way, but, you know, I start with what little thing brings you joy and can you do it once a day whether it's 30 minutes whether it's an hour I'm not saying necessarily working out or going for a drive those things are cool but like what fuels you to be who you are like are you an artist do do you like to sing do you play the cello whatever do it and so get to a point where you can plan to make whatever you're doing economical for you, like make it financially stable for you, you know, whether it's a hobby, whether it's something you're just picking up, it doesn't really matter, but just you, we have so many skills that we just let go to the wayside as pharmacists because we're thinking, oh, well, let's just duck down and do what we have to do. And that's not the way it should be, man. Like you have to look at what brings you joy. So this is bigger than pharmacy. I don't care what you love. It was about me saying, the line. If you love to serve people, how can you serve people? And then serve them and then, you know, help yourself grow and and flourish and thrive and not just feel like you have to check in and check out into a nine to five. When I think about those stages that you walk through, it sounded like you were a diamond in the rough who was just left in the rough, right? You weren't given those opportunities to pursue the things that you really wanted to do. I feel like many pharmacists are in that position. You think about the typical process we go through. So we went through six years of school, average debt load right now, and most recent year is like $165,000, $175,000. It's like, I'm going to take whatever job I can get. Mm-hmm. Not a job that I love, not a job that, you know, whatever. I just need money. Mm-hmm. And we overlook what brought us to pharmacy, what interests us. Mm -hmm. Using that as a career is a powerful foundation. And so you shifted kind of in a way we're almost forced to shift, right? It was, you know, the story that you told me, you know, it was kind of like a a literal wake up call, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You get, you got to change the lawn. You got to find something that really sparks you. Mm -hmm. And what I love about your story, I I know the end, right? I know that, Hey, you took that spark and you've become indispensable and that indispensableness creates momentum. And you're now seeing opportunities and you're seeing, I mean, you were just telling me the other week, like people are reaching out to you to come onto the media and talk about uh, the COVID vaccine. And so, which is great indirect marketing for yourself. Right. So 
tell me about those first steps. People often like wonder and worry about the first steps of doing something new or crazy. You mentioned, you know, you were part of that nonprofit. Was that like the first perhaps free thing that you did to kind of dip your toe into the water? Yeah. Yeah, man. It, it And that was the key to the ignition that changed my entire mindset. I had mm-hmm. to have an entire mindset change. I am a stubborn six foot four black male. I, I don't, I don't, I'm just generally stubborn, okay? If <laughs> you tell me whatever, I'm gonna say, no, let me research and then say, okay, I'll think about it. Like, I mean, <laughs> so it, it took me seeing that I can have a life outside of what I'm doing. Like I was literally, a passenger in my own life, you know, every day, every hour. And I didn't live for me. And so working with senior pharmacists helped me to see why the hell can I do this? I'm doing this now. And I still do it with them because that's how much I love what they do. So I'm saying, even if, even if you're interested in fashion design, a lot of it is mindset change. And so the first few steps for me were one, I did what I loved and that was volunteering and service for people in need. That fueled this little seed in my head to start thinking, all right, I'm gonna have a business. I have to do this. I have to help people. Why not use the skills I already have and go forward? And so what they call this is the quantum leap. And I read it, there are a couple of books that can talk about this. There's U squared and the 12 week year, et cetera. But you're basically taking the leap into entrepreneurship when you start thinking this way. Once you change that mindset that's telling you, I have this limit, there's no way I could ever make that much, there's no way I could work four hours a day and still make thousands of dollars a week. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And it's something that, you know, by God, I did not see a year and a half ago. Okay? I did not. This is not something where I'm some super maven like random guru wonderkin this was literally changing my mindset and i first started with getting some of the right coaches so business coaches i highly recommend pharmacy coaches highly recommend whatever life coach highly recommend invest in yourself don't see it as a cost see it as an opportunity and that was one thing i've had to change is we aren't necessarily business people, salespeople in, in healthcare, no. you know? No. <laughs> We're not. We're just not trained to think that way. So that was the first step. Yeah. Was in the beginning, I had to change my mindset to, you just do it. Do not go into the analysis paralysis that every pharmacist does about anything. Like, do not let yourself limit what you can do. And so that mm. took me like a couple weeks ago to start like, all right, I got to stop doing that. It was a habit that, you know, being stubborn of me, I had to break that because I ended up stopping my own progress, you know, and this led to guests speaking on ABC. This led to being featured on so many church panels across the state where I'm having discussions with people I would never have met before as a pharmacist, just to say, hey, here's what's in the vaccine. Hey, here's what's in Pfizer. Here's what's in Moderna. This is stuff that we know. Guys, this isn't anything I'm doing special. It's just, I'm literally reading off the monograph. (laughs) I'm saying, (laughs) hey, storage is this, X, Y, Z, here are the side effects. And then I talk through any vaccine hesitancy or conspiracy theory circling around. And that led to me getting over, what, seven media features in one month? Alex, even today, I just got the phone before this call with PBS. So I'm doing a special Mm. on PBS on Friday talking about vaccine hesitancy and COVID disparities when it comes to health equity with these vaccine rollouts. And this is just me being a pharmacist. I'm not doing extensive research. And so you don't know where this world of opportunity comes when you start just leaping, taking that trust in yourself and in the process and getting out of your own head. And that, you know, as is, is, is easy it may sound, it's not easy, but it's doable. And I want to make sure pharmacists know they have that power to do it. Journey before destination, right? I mean, yeah. you didn't start this thinking, okay, I'm going to have a six-figure business and it's going to be making this much money. This is how we're making it. 
it's just one imperfect step at a time. Yes. Yeah. And give yourself the grace to make. I'm, I, I, I'm glad you got fired. You know, you're a better person. <laughs> you're, you're killing it. You know, you said a few things that I just want to be clear about what you said. It is true. We as pharmacists, we've got a lot of great knowledge that the public wants. We have a lot of services that the public wants. Mm -hmm. Yes, doing business requires gumption and hustle and effort. You've done something pretty magnificent that a lot of people aren't willing to do. I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. It's not that I'd want to be like careful to downplay how hard it is to do what you what you did. It's true. Anyone can start business. It's also true. It does take blood, sweat, and tears at times. As you've gone from, you know, working for the man to working for yourself, what has been some of the fear, perhaps a great fear that you have worked yourself out of or had to maybe overcome in this journey? Oh man, great question. There are a couple of things. The first one that I've had to learn uh, relatively quickly mm -hmm. was how to set up boundaries for what I can and won't do. Oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt. I'm laughing because um, I, I focus my coaching just on business. We have our team of coaches that focus on careers mm -hmm. and that's, I, I need to put it in the curriculum because every pharmacist wants to serve. Yeah. I assume that was your, your, I wouldn't say downfall because it's a strength. We want to help, but right. boundaries, tell us about why you struggled with boundaries. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're good, man. Um, in launching this, you get really excited with the fact that you could do whatever you want, right? <laughs> and so when you're in this lane, I'm like, oh, I want to be on that board. Oh, I want to help with this. Oh, I want to be on that committee. I want to serve, serve, serve. And I started neglecting my own business in the first quarter. It's like, oh, <laughs> I haven't even focused on sales. Oops. But I'm having so much fun. I want to keep serving. Yeah. Uh, but but Delaney, you haven't focused on sales. <laughs> so it's like, how can you have a business if you haven't focused on sales? So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't want to do this. But I had to establish what do I want in five years? What do I want in 10 years? Your business is your retirement strategy, people. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm going to I'll reference him. If you ever are thinking about doing a podcast, I recommend this great character named Jay Wong. He and I were having discussion years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we were uh, just talking back and forth about entrepreneurship. And I, I brought up that random question about, hey, I know you're in business full time. Like, what's your retirement plan? Uh, I had just started my business full time and he helped bring about a fundamental shift. He's like, retirement, what are you talking about? I was like, well, you know, I, I was maybe a little def defensive. Oh, no, you know, I plan on always working. And I do. I love to work. I can't imagine not working for an entire year. But I said, but what about retirement? Like, aren't you investing in the stock market or something? He said, my business is my retirement plan that yeah. I'm putting my everything into this. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that makes, that makes sense. Right. So I love hearing that from you. That's a great fundamental shift to make so early on. It, it was needed, bro. Apart from being broke for a couple of months and, or not even broke in the red, because you're, you're putting your all into this. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't have buku bucks going into this business. Um, it was, I had a little bit of savings from the six years of working retail and Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a couple thousand so i wasn't balling here i'm still not to this day and to give you even more kudos you started this during the pandemic i did when money is tight <laughs> i did <laughs> super tight Woo! um i started this literally as i was fired during the pandemic without unemployment because they fired me so i couldn't even get unemployment so yeah i definitely did that <laughs> oh man, I I can I feel the pain because when COVID happened, we had a lot of people reaching out to us who were unemployed and 
we typically don't serve people who are unemployed. They don't have income, yeah. right? And I, I've i talked with them and I feel their pain. I know that you got a part-time job, right? Yes. So that that obviously helps, you know, swayed your fears because I was, I was about to go down the rabbit hole of like, what did you tell yourself that you were starting a business while doing this? But I think it goes to show that we live in a market right now where the best way to start a business is on the side. Brittany Hoffman Eubanks, who's been on the podcast, she did the same thing. Many people who have created businesses do it on the side. Mm-hmm. It's what I did. And give us kind of like a timeline, because it sounds like your timeline was a lot faster than mine. Mm-hmm. You started the business as soon as you got fired, you went full on into it, but you also had this part-time job. Sure. What was that timeline like for, okay, you're working part-time, building the business, and then the we should probably have video with this podcast, you know, where, cause I'm moving my hands around where you've got this shift away from the income from the part-time and the shift to the, to the business. That's the, um, like, that's the sticky point. A lot of business owners come to me about is like, okay, how do I take 5k or 10k mm-hmm. per month and two exit, three exit? I wish I knew the answer to that, but no, it's, it's not easy. I'll say that I, I'll say for people doing this, um, to try to have a plan, gradually go into it, put your toe in the water, establish, you know, the basics, get your name, your entity, et cetera, covered, and then start selling your value. But start telling your story and start talking about your value. Do not do like me and get a $5,000 website with no clients. Do not, you know, get all these social media mail chimps and don't even have a mailing list. Like, do not get a, a one pager with, don't do that. Don't make the mistake. And this is where I feel having a coach is so important. But focus on lean. What I mean, my lean is minimal costs on launching your business and establishing yourself as an authority, no matter who yeah. you are. So, in terms of what I had to do, yeah, I was broke as hell. I, I, I just got fired and had like a couple K saved up to, to, to survive. And luckily I had my car paid off, but despite that, I, I made some mistakes. And so I didn't mm. have the answer, but I will say that I am always, I'm pretty conservative with my funds. So up to this point, six years of being a pharmacist, I made sure my financial stuff was in good, good, good housekeeping. So I had savings, I had, you know, funds, I had some things set up where I could fall with a nice pillow instead of the hard concrete. And so yeah. I'm able to dip into that if need be. I don't recommend using your personal funds for your business. I know sometimes you start out doing that, I get it. But after a while, you got to get all business funds. But that being said, have a plan and start gradually. I, I, I would never tell you to quit your day, day job. And, I, and this is no downplay to people who are working in the trenches on COVID right now and on the front lines. Like I commend you. Um, but I will say if you're thinking about this, start getting the basics down, set a goal, do something once a week to get to that point to where your side job is not paying for your full-time salary. And it it, it yeah. will happen once you put in that work and get the right. Don't be the mistakes I did. That's all. Couldn't agree more. Validation before investment. Um, yes. It's harder to do when you've got, say, like a product-based business, you know, you're looking more for the investment, but Mm -hmm. we're pharmacists. And so in general, we create service-based businesses. Exactly. Best way to do that, make some money first, Mm -hmm. get referrals, make the process down. Then you can focus on marketing and investments and all those things. Yeah. 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 I've heard similar stories of people that were like, I had this idea and I spent thousands of dollars on this website and a marketing plan. And I'm like, okay, how many sales do you have? What do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, oh! ah! Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. So you got a pretty website, but you're broke. So yeah. you don't have a business. You know what I'm saying? And this is something I yeah. have a hard way. I'm with you. It happens. And we as pharmacists, especially are very, if we don't have A, then we can't do B, then we can't do C, we can't. life isn't linear like that. And having a business you'll find can be completely random. You don't know who's out there looking at you saying, hey, this is great. Let's put you on board. Um, So honestly, Mm -hmm. my first few clients all came from referrals 
from friends and family who mm -hmm. knew what I'm trying to do and I was able to convey the value that I'm offering. And so start with what value are you bringing? Is it to your local pharmacy? Is it to the patient directly? Is it to you know a medical office? Who are you trying to work with? Who are you trying to target? If you're trying to target them, then you gotta start speaking your ideal client's language. Once you know their language, you can start selling whatever you want. And that's where we as pharmacists can really change the game in entrepreneurship and what we can offer in healthcare. I like it. Now you're in a space mm -hmm. where, I mean, I, I would assume it's kind of like me, like you probably didn't go into pharmacy school thinking, I'm going to create a business one day. You're the, you're the captain of your ship, as it were. Where do you hope to see both yourself and your business, let's say like five years from now? I would say, I, I would say I would want to be nationally recognized in five years. And I also want to be practicing pharmacy across the entire country in five years. So whether that takes contracting with pharmacists who have a passion for geriatric care or just really out of the box thinking in healthcare solutions, that's my goal. So I do encourage um, those thinking about this to kind of think down the road. So yeah, national recognition for me saving my patients millions of dollars in unnecessary healthcare costs, as well as medication management. That's one of my personal goals. I also wanna be known as the, the Clark Howard of healthcare savings. I wanna be that guy who people can refer to, to know that they're gonna get legitimate consulting that's in the best interest of their patients. I mean, how many times you go in somewhere, you barely talk to a doctor, barely talk to a nurse, you're seeing the 20 minutes and yeah. then you can't expect to have all your healthcare questions answered. And so you try to save it or send it in a chart or something, but you're not going to get an answer for a week or two. So I'm like, yeah. pharmacists can do this and do it all day for free. I am doing the same thing in PJs at home. <laughs> that is the mindset shift, you know? And so in five years, man, I see myself having a team of patient access navigators, patient advocates, social workers, community healthcare workers, pharmacists, gerontologists if need be. And this is all gonna be team-based. And so I've already done podcasts and consults internationally. I've already done work in the Caribbean, in Grenada, which I never thought would happen. But I mean, that's the power we have. And unfortunately, healthcare is worse when you're outside of our country in some of those third world places where they don't even have diabetic guidelines. They don't even have that. It's like, yeah. you only have one choice, metformin or insulin, that's it. So it's like, there's a whole different world of layers to the level of pharmacist input across healthcare systems. And so one of my goals, apart from just being that advocate here is figuring out the game across the world. I love it. I pause because the thought came to me, this podcast could go on for a lot longer because you're talking mm -hmm. about things now that we're getting involved in. We, mm -hmm. We've started some efforts in Costa Rica, helping out pharmacy there. Wow. And I want to dive there, but I'm recognizing time. And I want to ask you one more important question. And that is, sure. when you were in that dour moment, yeah. you just got word, you're done. We don't want to work with you. And you've got all these hopes and the streams. You've, you're a diamond in the rough who's been jaded by the system. You're burnt out. You're not happy. Yep. You know, you've, I've, I'm going to give you a time machine. You can go back in time and talk to yourself in that moment. What would you say to yourself in that moment? I'll say this as politely as possible <laughs> in that I have literally had to kill off my former self to be the person you're seeing today. Like that belong was a complete disassociated, unenthused, almost hateful, and like almost self-loathing, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so, I, and I, I do suffer from anxiety and depression. That's a chronic thing. I've, I've had it, this time for quite a while, but I never even took the time to try to treat that. And I knew I've had it since my teenage years. I'm now taking the effort to actually work out and actually try to take medicine to treat myself. I never cared about myself, Alex. 
I never cared about myself. And this is something I'm almost ashamed to say, but I never put myself first. I never cared about me. I only cared about other people's feelings. So a part of it was getting rid of that people pleasing part of me. A part of it was self-appreciation and self-love. I didn't have that. And so what I'm telling myself is to stop listening to that little nasally evil voice in your head and start seeing what you can be. And, and don't just make it some foofy fanny tale, fairy tale, like make this your actual reality. Like appreciate what you've done to get to this point and see that there is hope. Because, you know, again, I would see the Alex Barker happy. I wasn't happy, so there's no way he's so happy. There's no way. <laughs> and so sure. it starts with, again, the mindset change. I'm like, Galan, if it were me saying, Galan, look, bro, I know you think this is bad, and it is. Don't get me wrong. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna downplay that. It is kind of bad. But you can change the way that that impacts your feelings. You could change the way that affects your mindset, and you could definitely change the way you can dictate your future. And I never believed that. Powerful stuff. It's unfortunate that I think I felt the same way. I know a lot of pharmacists feel the same way when I think about just how devalued we are. I mean, we're doctorate level people and we feel like we're the lowest on the totem pole and we feel really angry. I mean, if you just, if I've learned to not be overly positive particularly in public places where pharmacists are online because I'll get chewed up and spit and out. We have a pervasive negativity and yeah, it's definitely. sad, but it, it, it takes a reflection of oneself to move past that. I'm really glad you did because the odds were against you. Good job. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. I mean, it, it, I had to, it was, it was a mixture of self-preservation and <laughs> yeah, I cannot be this unhappy for 30 more years. I can't. Mm. And that was the reality. I was like, I had to make a shift. I'm glad you made the shift and I'm excited to see what you work on next. And I want to end the podcast here because I want to talk to you about some other stuff. So if people want to check out your stuff, where can they go to see it? Absolutely. So we have tons of free content. Um, for patients, caregivers, providers, all alike, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of goodies on ways you can save money on healthcare costs. Definitely check out our website, geriatrics.org, G E R I A T R X is an X ray.org. You can find me there. My cell is there. People can reach me for anything. Um, I'll be happy to meet you. I'm here to help serve and empower other pharmacists too. Well, and thanks for hanging out with me. I had a lot of fun. Hey, same, Alex. You know it. We'll do this soon. <laughs> <laughs>